Good morning, and very much welcome to Finance Panel and the Finance Panel. Uh, this is a seminar series that's been going on for quite some time. It's a co-production between SNS, the leading Swedish think tank in whose premises we are, and the Swedish House of Finance, which is a financial research center, national financial research center, located at the Stockholm School of Economics. Uh, and this time it's also co-produced with the um, EU Commission representative office in Stockholm. Uh, and my name is Per Wiesien. I work at the Swedish House of Finance and I will moderate this morning. And the topic is financial stability and the threat posed by volatile energy markets. And we said before we talked here that a year ago, I wouldn't have dreamed of the possibility of energy markets threatening financial stability. And still that is what has happened. That is uh, where we are. We have seen crisis coming from real estate and from undercapitalized banks and, and a whole lot of other things, but not from energy markets. So we have really two ambitions with a seminar this morning, we would like to try to explain how could it be uh, that this is threatening this st stability of the whole system. Um, and we will give two perspectives on this one, a Swedish Scandinavian perspective delivered by Caroline Ekholm. I will present the speakers more thoroughly later. And one European presented by Paulina de Mekak, who is with us, though the screen is black now, from Brussels on the screen. And the problem is the same, basically, in all European countries. It's not that. But the solutions may look a bit different because it's not exactly the same thing in all European or EU countries. And we will try to see if we can figure out why that is so. Um, and then... Um, so Carolina and then Paulina. And after that, we will have uh, Vincent Morin, who is an assistant professor of finance at the Stockholm School of Economics, and also active uh, at the Swedish House of Finance. And he will try to sort of tell us what the mechanisms are behind uh, these problems. And after Vincent, Danila Peterhoff, who works at, where are you? There you are, uh, at Nasdaq. Uh, and she will give us the perspective from the exchange. And finally, uh, Mats Persson at Fortum, one of the energy producers and what it looks like from them. And when we're done with that, we will hopefully have roughly half an hour or so for questions and discussion. And I strongly encourage you. I mean, this is a great panel. And, and there are lots of questions, at least I had lots of questions before I did all the reading I have to do to, to moderate this uh, and take the opportunity. And if you have uh, views on sort of the solutions and the policy perspective, please voice your, your opinions. So first on stage, uh, Carolina Ekholm, I will move away, take my stuff. Carolina is... Uh, she is presently general director of the Swedish National Debt Office, and she's also a member of the Swedish, Nas uh, Swedish Financial Stability Council, uh, uh, the group that recommended the Swedish government to issue credit guarantees of 250 billion Swedish a couple of weeks or months ago, a news that was hard to uh, grasp when it, when it came. Uh, and she will explain to us how this works from her perspective. So please, Carolina, the floor is yours. So thank you, Per. Um, and good morning, everyone. Uh, yes, so I thought I would start by saying something uh, about how electricity is traded and where these uh, financial transactions um, come uh, into play. And then I'm going to say something about the role of so-called central counterparties in the financial system. And in Sweden, we have one uh, central counterparty and that is uh, NASA clearing. 
And then obviously I'm going to uh, say something about uh, the government credit guarantee that was uh, introduced in Sweden in early September and uh, something about the background uh, to that decision. Uh, but let me start then with the electricity market. I, I, I think that many here are probably uh, well aware that uh, the main place where sort of physical trade in electricity takes place uh, in the Nordic region is Nordpool. Uh, we have uh, a deregulated uh, market for electricity. Uh, so selling and buying electricity is free. Uh, we do have, um, when it comes to the distribution networks, there are, there are monopolies, so that's a regulated part of the market. So it's all uh, quite complicated. Uh, I see that there are people here that are <laughs> well uh, versed and uh, are experts uh, in, the, in this area. So if you have questions about this part of the market, I think there are competence here in the room that can guide us. Uh, but uh, on Nordpool, the main market there is the day ahead market uh, where the spot price is determined by, by uh, supply and demand through auctions. Uh, but then there are uh, financial contracts traded based on electricity, and that serves an important purpose. Uh, those contracts, they can be traded on an exchange or they can be traded uh, bilaterally. And in the Nordic region, the main exchange for such contracts, that's Nasdaq Commodities. Uh, so it's a, a part of Nasdaq. And uh, in this market, uh, electricity uh, sellers and buyers, uh, they are hedging uh, their trades by uh, selling and buying future production and consumption at uh, prices that are uh, predetermined. Uh, so for households and firms, that uh, enables them to secure future electricity costs. So that's uh, an important role that this, uh, this market plays. And for the producers, um, it plays the important role of enabling them to secure compensation for their future production costs. Uh, so that's the sort of the underlying setup. Um, now, um, we so a lot of these uh, derivative contracts, they are cleared uh, by NASDAQ clearing, so which is a central counterparty. And uh, the advantages with this is that uh, it's a, a way to reduce a counterparty risk. So der derivative trading entails counterparty risk. Each party can may default uh, on the contract but with the central counterparty um, uh, it is the 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 it takes the counterparty risk of both the buyers and the sellers um, and uh, that enables a, a, a system where where risks can be uh, better dealt with and these types of entities, they have become more and more important uh, in the financial systems. Uh, and uh, uh, we, uh, as an authority, the Swedish National Debt Office, uh, we uh, became uh, the resolution authority, that is the responsible authority for dealing with, uh, with uh, a, a central counterparty in, in crisis. Uh, in August uh, this year. So that means that we are the uh, relevant resolution authority for NASDAQ clearing. Uh, now, um, central clearing of derivatives is something that has increased uh, quite a lot uh, in the aftermath of the global financial crisis. So before that, uh, the majority of derivative tradings was uh, done uh, bilaterally, uh, and in the aftermath of the crisis, it was this was identified as as a problem, 
uh, it uh, meant that uh, this was a, a very unregulated part of the financial market. There was also a lack of information about uh, what positions uh, different parties had. So uh, at the G20 levels, there was an agreement that all standardized derivative contracts should be cleared uh, through central counterparties. And that's something that then has been sort of implemented in legislation and regulation uh, yeah, since then. Uh, so there's now new regulation in place uh, that points to central counterparties for uh, at least uh, some deri derivative trade. And uh, with that has also um, come um, regulations for the central counterparties on, on, on how they should uh, handle their risks. Now, one advantage with central counterparties is that uh, they have um, sort of a a, sa a, a safety net that is sort of predefined and uh, set up uh, in advance. Uh, so to be able to guarantee payment at all times, uh, they have uh, various um, uh, financial resources to, to use. Uh, so the main uh, part of this or uh, the more basic, the most basic part uh, uh, that's uh, uh, margins uh, that the the clearing members need to uh, to pay. So the central party requires collateral. Um, so there's uh, an initial margin that a clearing member has to put up in order to uh, to enter into a, a, a transaction. Uh, but then over time, of course, there may be these unrealized uh, losses or, or, or gains, uh, and uh, that then um, generates a requirement if there are unrealized losses for the clearing members to, to pay uh, variation margins. Um, so that's something that they may have to do uh, on an intra or on a daily or intraday basis. Then uh, the central counterparty has its own resources to chip in if there are problems. And then there are also uh, default funds where the clearing members have um, pledged uh, or paid in um, resources in order to cover losses. So these are the, this is the sort of the main uh, most important safety net. Now let's uh, turn to what happened this year. So uh, if we think about the electricity producers, so I mean, on the, on the uh, electricity derivative markets, there are different types of clearing members involved. Um, there are uh, these buyers and uh, there are these um, uh, selling companies. Uh, there are these uh, uh, firms that actually produce electricity. And there may also be more speculative elements, although uh, my assessment would be that there's less of that today than uh, before an event in, in 2018 when there was a default uh, by one of the members uh, on, on the commodity clearing market. Uh, but the, for the electricity producers, they enter contracts to sell electri electricity at predetermined prices in the future. And of course, for them, typically they know the cost for them to actually supply the electricity in the future because they're going to supply it from their own production. So they do this in order to uh, ensure uh, a profit on what they expect that they will produce. Uh, but uh, because uh, these unrealized losses are compensated each day and they will vary with the price, how, depending on how prices move, um, that um, doesn't really, it doesn't really help them in this market that they are likely to end up with a, a profit uh, in the end. Because these uh, losses that generate uh, margin calls they don't necessarily match the cash flow of these producers. So then they have to borrow uh, to pay these margins. 
And uh, as you can see in this uh, graph uh, uh, here on, on the right hand side, there was this exceptional price movements uh, uh, in the summer and in August this um, led to difficulties in, in borrowing sufficiently to meet these uh, margin requirements. So that's the sort of the background uh, to authorities de um, determining that there were problems in this market. And if there had been a member failure to meet margin requirements and then uh, a default, um, you know, it's the it's something that you know might have been handled uh, without any complications by the safety net at Nasdaq clearing, but it could also potentially lead to spillover effects and then potentially to financial instability. Uh, yeah, so um, on the basis of that, um, uh, the uh, uh, the government uh, went to Swedish Parliament and um, asked uh, them to agree to, uh, to to a decision to mandate us to provide credit guarantees for loans to electricity producers. So this was targeting the producers that were most likely going to end up with profits, uh, but uh, at this particular point in time, time faced liquidity problems. Uh, so uh, this, uh, we were mandated on uh, September the 5th, and this is a program that extends until end of March uh, 2023. So the purpose of this measure was to uh, prevent that a lack of liquidity uh, created risk for contagions to, to uh, other parts of the financial system. Uh, I don't think that anyone made uh, the assessment that uh, this was something that would happen with some uh, auto automatically, uh, but uh, there was a risk and it seemed like it could be easily avoided by ensuring that uh, fundamentally solvent uh, electricity companies um, uh, could be helped with their uh, liquidity situation. So the way this works is that electricity producers can apply for a loan through their bank um, and then the bank applies for a credit guaranteed from us and it covers 80% of the loan uh, and the overall envelope is, uh, as Per mentioned, 250 billion. And uh, one, I think, uh, good thing with uh, uh, the decision that was made relatively swiftly uh, is that um, other Nordic countries, Denmark and, and Finland, they also uh, very swiftly introduced corresponding schemes for liquidity support because this is the Nordic market. So there were absolutely Danish and Finnish um, clearing members uh, that were also uh, squeezed here. Uh, and um, it should be noted that no application has, uh, has been submitted to date, which we view as a good thing. Uh, this was ultimately done as a putting up a, a sort of a firewall, a preventive measure, and uh, hopefully um, it will stay that way, but if there are uh, re-emerging problems, uh, we, we know that we have something uh, to, to use. Um, so final remarks. Um, these uh, entities, central counterparties, they have become much more important for financial stability. It's partly uh, a consequence of uh, steps taken after the global financial crisis to push derivative, derivative trades into these, uh, these uh, entities. Um, and Nasdaq clearing, I should mention, of course, is a very important uh, player when it comes to central clearing of uh, purely uh, financial contracts or financial contracts based on financial uh, assets, uh, so equity and uh, fixed income derivatives. Uh, and one worry would be that there could be contagion uh, into um, these markets from stress elsewhere. And uh, as I said, this uh, 
scheme uh, that was introduced in Sweden. It's a preventive measure established to avoid that a liquidity shortage triggers uh, more serious problems. So let me stay there. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so our next, next speaker will not be on stage literally, but on screen, hopefully. Uh, I don't know if Paulina, there you are. <laughs> Paulina, welcome. Hi, good morning. Welcome to Stockholm on screen. Uh, we are so happy that you could take your time, your very busy time, we know, to, to be with us. Paulina works as uh, Director for General Affairs at DG Financial Stability, Financial Service and Capital Markets Union, FISMA. Uh, and, and the Commission is, as far as I understand, also looking into this problem of stability in energy markets and general financial stability issues. Please, Paulina, welcome, and the floor is yours, or the screen is yours. <laughs> Thank you very much, Per, and good morning to everyone. And I'm very sorry that I, I can't join you in person in, in Stockholm today. I, uh, I think you even have some snow. We certainly don't have snow here in, um, in Brussels. I wanted to share with you in the next couple of minutes a little bit what the um, European Commission has proposed that we have been doing in the area of uh, energy uh, financial markets. But before I enter into that, maybe uh, a few more general points. We are, of course, in a rather exceptional situation with the um, Russian war of aggression against Ukraine, which has obviously has horrific consequences, first of all, in Ukraine, but also a lot of uh, other implications. We see that uh, when it comes to food security in third countries. And we see that, of course, also when it comes to uh, energy security notably um, in Europe, but also also beyond. So I think this is something that the Commission has been, the European Commission has been uh, looking into and uh, for quite a while already uh, in terms of very quickly uh, reducing our dependence on fossil fuels uh, in general, which is something we need to do anyway in light of the um, climate crisis, but of course accelerate uh, this reduction of dependence on fossil fuels in general, and obviously on Russian fossil fuels in, in particular. We have also been encouraging member states to save energy. The cheapest energy is, of course, the ones we don't use at all. And also been taking measures around energy solidarity, joint purchasing, and, um, and, other, and other measures. So that, if you wish, is a bit the, the broader picture. There is, of course, here also a clear financial market dimension. And I think Carolina has explained that um, that's very well. What's happened here, uh, especially uh, late summer, beginning of the autumn, but of course, the situation remains very volatile and quite unstable, is, as Carolina explained, that margin calls have gone up quite significantly. Now, and Carolina mentioned that as well, that is as such a normal consequence of our rules and the rules that we on purpose put in place following the global financial crisis, precisely because we wanted to have more central clearing, we want to have a greater use of CCPs, and we want to make sure that the margin calls are sufficiently high, that the collateral requirements are sufficiently stringent to keep uh, these markets uh, very, very stable. So as such, the fact that the margin calls went up was a normal consequence of our rules. And I think um, in principle, the rules are good and they, there is no kind of fundamental problem with the rules as such. Now, the consequence this got was that energy companies basically found themselves in this relatively sudden liquidity squeeze because they had to then quickly put up very large amounts of cash for the margins. And of course, uh, even a company which is well run and solvent and all, and all the rest of it uh, will not necessarily be, um, let's say, equipped to, to have these kind of cash reserves to use very quickly. So in order to try to deal with that, to take a little bit of tension out of these um, liquidity stress situation, we've done a couple of things uh, on the financial market side. And this was the package um, that we put forward back in October, on the 18th of October. And uh, maybe to mention five points here in, in particular. The first one has to do with, uh, with collateral. Uh, so basically the point Carolina was, was making earlier. What we have proposed here is to make the rules on collaterals uh, slightly less stringent. So not only accepting 
cash as collateral, but also um, some other uh, types of, of funds, in this case, uncollateralized bank guarantees and also public guarantees. And ESMA, the European Securities and Markets Authority, has also made clear that under certain circumstances, also uh, EU bonds and certain corporate bonds will be uh, accepted as, as collateral. So all these are really attempts to make, um, to help energy companies to kind of survive, if you wish, this uh, liquidity squeeze that some of them have been, have been feeling. So that's the first point. Um, the second measure here is to increase the clearing threshold, which currently is 4 billion. This basically, sorry, it's currently 3 billion, it's being increased to 4 billion. And what this means is that for energy companies, uh, if they have a, um, a portfolio which is below 4 billion, they would not have to post collateral under the uh, EU um, CTP rules. So this is again a way of trying to take a little bit of pressure uh, away from the, from the current situation. Both these two measures are what we call delegated acts. That doesn't matter, that's commission bureaucracy. But what's important here is that it means that these are rules that the commission can do under existing empowerments in the EU legislation, meaning that we do not have the full process with member states and the European Parliament. This is basically a measure the commission puts forward and member states and the European Parliament then have the possibility to object, but if they don't object, then basically these measures can enter into application. So we hope that these uh, entry into application will happen very quickly now in the coming days, because both Council and Parliament have kind of indicated that they are not going to, uh, to object. So these were the two first measures. Then we have been looking into the issue of uh, excessive volatility. On, on, on the markets, and you saw that quite clearly also on the on the uh, slide that Carolina was, was showing uh, earlier. So what we have proposed in this area is to basically uh, require trading platforms to put in place a mechanism, a little bit as a circuit breaker, but basically if the prices, if you see excessive volatility, excessive price spikes uh, in the market within certain boundaries, then the trading platforms need to make sure that they have measures in place which would allow them to hold the trading uh, briefly to basically give that pause to the markets without, of course, uh, disrupting the price formation process. And that is why we have constructed this as a system where it's actually for the platforms to put these mechanisms in place, of course, under national supervision and with a, an important coordination role for the European Securities and Market Authority, ESMA, because, of course, we have integrated EU market in this area, and it's really, really important that we have ESMA here that makes sure that this is, this is coordinated. The, the, the issue here is really, as I said, to deal with excessive volatility, excessive price spikes, but, and trying to basically have a framing around that, which allows the uh, trading platforms to take action if, if necessary. This is a proposal from the Commission, which is now being looked at uh, by the Council, by the Member States. This is an emergency measure, which there is possibility to do under the EU treaties, especially if there is an emergency in the energy markets. But this is now, as I said, something that the Member States are looking at, and they will be the ones that should agree to this measure before it can enter into, into application. So that was the third point. Now, coming to the fourth point, and that has to do with uh, LNG uh, price indexes and uh, benchmarks. Today, we have a situation in Europe where we have the leading benchmark, which is the uh, Dutch title transfer facility, which is the benchmark for uh, pipeline gas coming into um, the Netherlands. That, I think, is, has worked very well as a proxy for all gas imports into the European Union. Now, what's happened is, of course, when we see that we have a more and more LNG tanker gas being used in addition or as replacement for the pipeline gas, there has been a sense saying that the TTF maybe is not as representative of all the LNG that we see in the EU market right now. And that's why we, together with the EU energy regulator, Acer, have started looking into this idea of a complementary benchmark. And that's of course something that cannot be done overnight. The idea would be that Acer, the energy regulator, would be collecting data with the idea of then during next year, um, putting this new uh, benchmark in place. And again, this is not to replace the TFF. It is really to have a complementary uh, benchmark that is hopefully uh, entirely representative of the, of the current market situation. And then the fifth point, and I think this is a really, really important one, and that has to do with, um, with market surveillance. Because what we have in Europe today is that we have 
the ACER, the EU Energy Regulator, which is monitoring and surveying the spot markets. And we have ESMA, the European Securities Market Authority, which is looking at the uh, derivatives um, energy uh, markets. And the sense that was there was that uh, maybe we just need to make sure that we really, that these two work really closely together. They were already working well together, but what we have tried to put in place now, or what these two regulators have put in place, is basically a task force to make sure that there is a very kind of seamless um, surveillance, if you wish, of the spot markets, of the derivatives market, and of course also uh, on the kind of conjuncture, if you wish, between the two. So I think that's an important part of the overall picture, just making sure that we have all the information we need about what is going on uh, on, these, on these markets. Now, um, state aid is another element here, and uh, Carolina explained the scheme that's been put in place in Sweden, similar schemes also in some other member states. In principle, of course, from the EU perspective, when member states give public support, when they give state aid, uh, we will always have the concern that we don't want to have a distortion of the single market here. Member states, of course, have different uh, willingness, different uh, capacities to uh, give public support. The good news here is that we have an EU state aid framework that precisely should make sure that member states that do give public support do that in a way that does not distort the single market. And what we did back in October was that we uh, put in place some simplifications, uh, some enabling rules in the state aid framework precisely to help member states to support energy companies that uh, sense that feel a certain liquidity squeeze at this moment. We did something similar back in the COVID time, basically making sure that the uh, EU state aid framework can facilitate for member states that want to give public support in this rather exceptional situation on the, on the energy markets. Final point I want to mention, and that is the consumer angle. What I mentioned here very much is, of course, the, the, the system level measures that we have uh, tried to put in place. And again, in, in good cooperation with the EU um, regulators, the ESMA and also the European Banking Authority. There is, of course, a really important consumer dimension to this in terms of consumers facing very high energy bills. Here we are more in the remit of national competence and EU competence, but we have tried at an EU level also to support member states in this process. Many member states have put in place schemes that are helping the most vulnerable households in particular. I think um, in Sweden also uh, such schemes are under, under consideration. We've also looked into the issue of whether, for example, energy companies can um, again, put measures in place to help the most vulnerable consumers, maybe in terms of um, letting them pay their bill in, in bills in, certain, in, in several installments. I think there is an issue around transparency. Sometimes it's difficult for consumers when they look at the energy bill to actually understand what exactly they are charged for. So that's also something that we have been discussing with industry, with stakeholders. Uh, this, of course, is not any kind of regulatory measure that can be taken at EU level, but really having a process which accompany member states in the kind of efforts that they may wish to uh, do to help the consumers and also small businesses in, in their countries. So this is, I think, a little bit of a snapshot of what we have tried to do at the EU level. Um, by way of conclusion, I really want to underline that what we have been very mindful of is that we would we wanted to do something that is meaningful, that helps the energy companies, that facilitates um, the, um, the the situation in this rather kind of complicated uh, and very asymmetric uh, supply and demand situation that we find ourselves in because of the, of the Russian aggression against Ukraine. But at the same time, we were very mindful that we do not want to do anything that could disrupt financial stability. I think the last thing anyone would want to see right now is an, a complicated, complicated situation in the energy sector translating into a complicated situation in the um, in the financial sector. So I think here, really here again, the, the um, our uh, motto, if you wish, has been to let's try to meaningfully help uh, the markets here, but clearly without kind of in any way um, endangering or or disrupting neither the price formation process nor uh, financial stability in in general. I will I will close there. Thank you very much again for inviting me this morning. Thank you very much, Paulina. That was a great uh, overview of everything that's going on. Uh, and to help us, well, clear up some of the concepts, some of the basic concepts.
We have invited Vincent Morin, who, as I said, is an assistant professor at the Stockholm School of Economics. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction, Per, and uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, yeah, so I thought I would talk a bit about the, the economics of, of margins. Um, so some of the, does it work? Yes, okay, that's good. Oh, yeah. I was told it's slow, so I should be uh, as well. Okay. Um, so I'm sure that you know we all heard about these words, you know, margin calls, liquidity stress, but uh, I will assume that it's not obvious to everyone what it actually means. So I will try to explain that a bit. And I think doing that will be useful to explain why you know the the the, the framework that we have right now with rising prices and increasing volatility uh, has created such a liquidity stress for energy producer, which I will call this perfect uh, liquidity storm. Uh, and then I will conclude by offering some thoughts on the current events and the proposals that have been made, in particular by ESMA. Okay, so I will use this picture. Let's see if we have it here. Oops, here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so suppose you're an energy producer. So, you know, uh, Matt, I'm going to take the example of Fortum, for example, and uh, you're interested in selling your electricity uh, ahead of time. So in January 2023, right? Uh, and you know you can produce it for let's say 30 euros per megawatt. -er. You know why do you know that? Because you have a predictable source of uh, power, which is hydropower or nuclear power, for example. Now, what you don't know yet is what the what is the spot price at which you're going to be able to sell that electricity one year from now, right? Um, and sometimes, like here, the price might be too low compared to your cost. So what do you want to do? Well, you want to edge, so you want to enter in what is called a future contract. Uh, and this future contract will give you a price at which you can sell this electricity in January 2023, right? Instead of being exposed to this fluctuation, you're going to secure uh, this profit of five euro per megawatt, right? So that's why this, this edging uh, is so great because it gives you price, a price guarantee uh, as the energy producer, okay? There are different ways in which you can settle this contract, but the baseline is that instead of having a risky cash flow at the end, you get a safe cash flow of this, of this five. Okay. Now, suppose that we now in March uh, 2022, and now what we expect is that in January 2023, the price will be much more risky, but will also be potentially much higher, right? Um, and so it has an impact in the future markets. So now the price of this contract is 45. It means that people are willing to pay 45 euro per megawatt for electricity that will be delivered in January 2023, right? So how does it affect our energy producer, uh, Fortum? Well, the way it works in this case is that Fortum will have to make what is called a variation uh, margin call, right? So what's the idea here? Well, in financial terms, Fortum has actually made a loss. Why? Because they initially, initially sold for 35, something that is now worth 45. So what's the logic for the buyer? The buyer is now thinking, well, we expect the spot price to be much higher in January 2023. How can I be sure that Fortum will actually deliver uh, this energy at the price of 35, right? So the idea of this variation margin call is in a sense to reset the exposure of the buyer uh, to the seller to zero, right? It's as if we net the current losses and gains and we enter this new contract at the price of 45. That's kind of the basic idea. Right? So this is some practice because this reduces the counterparty exposure uh, of the buyer and the seller. But as you can imagine, in an environment with rising prices, uh, the seller here will have to make a lot of this variation margin call. Right? So although you know, rising energy prices feel like a good thing for energy producers, because of these margin calls, it can create some liquidity stress because you have to make this payment in cash or very safe collateral. Right? So that's one component. Now, suppose, and again, now I'm not going to take the example of Fortum, but suppose that the buyer is worried that the seller might not be able to make this payment, right? Now, there's something else that's going to kick in, which is called the initial margin, right? So what's the idea here? Suppose we worry that the seller cannot make this payment anymore to the buyer. Well, presumably, the buyer will want to enter a new contract, right? Because the buyer also wants to edge the price at which it's going to get electricity in January 2023, okay? So the initial margin will be meant to protect the buyer against the risk of the default of the seller and the other way around, okay? So how does it work? Well, you know, to replace its current contract, the buyer, you know, will have to enter a new contract, but that typically takes time, right? And the time it takes, you know, is usually called MPOR. That's just a barbaric name, but this is the idea that to enter a new contract, it will actually take time. And 
while you wait to enter this new contract as the buyer, well, the price of the future contract might have moved. And in particular, it might have moved against you. Now, as a buyer, it's much more difficult to actually, uh, much more costly, sorry, uh, to actually enter this future contract. So how is, is the initial margin uh, computed? Well, we're going to say, um, no, I'm losing my effect completely here. Okay, do we have, maybe can you move the next slide? Yes, exactly, thank you. So we're going to think, okay, for the buyer, at a 99% 9 confidence level, doesn't have to be 99, but it's just to give an idea, how much can you lose? Because during this date, when the seller defaults, and that date when you replace the contract, the price might have moved against you, right? And this amount here will be basically the initial, the initial margin, right? So how much collateral the seller has to put in order to protect the buyer against the risk of default. What happens when there's a lot of volatility? Well, a lot of volatility just means that this green bar here will be very large. So that will increase the initial margin that you have to post uh, in, the first, in the first place. So that's why I was saying that there's a perfect liquidity storm because for energy producers, you have to post a lot of collateral for the variation margin, which because the price increase, and you have to post a lot of collateral for the initial margin because the volatility increases, right? So this is basically what happens uh, in the bottom line. So how does it translate when you look at the picture? So this is, uh, this is from the recent ECB financial stability report. So this is not uh, Sweden, but this is about the euro area. What you see in blue here is the initial margins that uh, clearing members, so people would trade in the CCPs that were mentioned before, uh, has increased over time, right? Uh, this is the declaration of the invasion. Uh, and here, this is the recent episode where in August that was uh, shown by Carolina, where the price have increased uh, like crazy. And that also has led to an increase in initial margins, right? What you have seen at this time is that uh, these energy producers, they have, they have to draw on their credit lines from banks in order to finance these liquidity needs. And this is also when some governments step in in order to guarantee these credit lines from banks to uh, energy producers, okay? So that's the situation. So now, as I said, I want to offer a quick thoughts on, on the proposal that have been made. Um, so the question is, you know, how to alleviate the liquidity stress for margin calls for these energy producers, right? And I'm gonna talk about two of the ESMA proposals uh, that were actually brought, brought up before. Um, so the first proposal yes, uh, is to broaden, broaden the range of collateral that you can post for these initial margin requirements, right? Now, I would argue that this is kind of a good thing you know, to the extent that you discount this collateral properly, right? So posting a Swedish government bond shouldn't be the same thing as posting an EU corporate bond, for example. But CCPs have you know, uh, things in place in order to ensure that this is the case. This is called air cuts. Now, the second proposal, this is not coming, uh, as was just mentioned, is to increase the clearing threshold from 3 billion to 4 billion. What does it mean? It means that some trades will move to, from the CCPs that are well regulated uh, and transparent to what is called the over the counter segment of the market, right? Where you have bilateral trading. Uh, now, I don't think that's such a good thing because as was mentioned before, we introduced these CCPs uh, for good reason, right? Because we think that they are better equipped to take care of counterparty risk in this kind of market. I want to mention also, as well that energy producers already have an exemption from clearing uh, for their edging activity, right? Uh, so, you know, to make the case that we need to increase the clearing threshold now so that there's gonna be trades moving from CCPs to the over the counter segment, uh, I will tend to be uh, not in favor of this of this of this proposal. Uh, what I think is is more interesting is to try to have the CCPs, the energy producers, and the market participants come together and to think about what is you know maybe the appropriate level of initial margins. I would say that the CCPs thinking typically is to say, well, if a member default, we want to be protected 100 percent, right? We want the collateral of this member to actually completely cover uh, the default cost of of this member. But I think this thinking might lead you to ask for very, very high uh, initial margins. And I think we shouldn't forget that the point of CCPs in the first place was not to totally eliminate counterparty risk by asking counterparties to post a crazy amount of collateral, but to share this risk in a more orderly fashion than what you would have in the bilateral segment of this market where you don't know what's going on, okay? Um, we've seen in some of the markets, for example, the TTF markets for gas that was mentioned, that some of the initial margin were like 80% of the actual amount of the contract, which kind of makes uneconomical to actually edge this, uh, these trades. Okay, so it's easy to criticize. Uh, so now I just want also to propose some, some tools going forward. Of course, in an exposed situation, when you have a liquidity stress, you have to intervene. Uh, 
and you actually want to help these energy producers. Now, going forward, what, what could work, and you know, some of these tools are not, are not new, you could think about contracyclical margin requirements for CCPs. This is actually something that ESMA has been proposing for quite some, some time. What is the idea? In good times, you ask a bit more margin than what will, would make sense. You keep that as a buffer fund, and you can use that in bad times when volatility is very high and there's a lot of pressure, pressure sorry, on this, on this market participants. Now, another thing that you might want to think about is that if non-financial corporations like energy producers engage a lot in this derivative trading, and this derivative trading requires a lot of liquidity for these margin calls, you might think about liquidity requirements for non-financial corporations. And it could take very simple forms, such as having these energy producers having already in place some credit lines for example, from, from their banks, right? Not having to actually ask for a credit line when uh, the time are bad, okay? And uh, I will conclude with this and I'm very much looking forward to the other uh, two presentations. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was a crash course in <laughs> derivatives trading on, on the electricity markets. Daniela Petrov, please. Daniela is uh, a senior vice president and president clearing and Head of European Market Strategy at NASDAQ here in Stockholm. Can you hear me like this? Excellent. Good morning. What a wonderful seminar with so many people speaking about CCPs. I don't get that very often, I have to say. Um, but it, it has been a little bit more of that in the last months, as you can imagine, as a result of the developments. Um, and it tends to then be relatively high level. So I'll try to keep it also relatively high level coming back to some of the points that all of you made and then open up for some of the discussion I think we're going to have. Um, so just to play back the, um, the situation that we saw in the energy markets from, from a Nasdaq perspective, uh, we obviously saw record high prices and volatility, as you mentioned before. Um, as a result of that, the, the cleared volume went down 30 to 40%. So when you say, uh, Vincent, that it might go down further, I don't really like that. So we have to debate that later on. Um, then there was also an increase in the margin requirements overall of, I think, six times. Um, and there were a few other clearing houses in Europe that had 10 times the margin requirements they had the year before. So you can imagine um, also coming back to some of the, the regulatory remarks that this is obviously how the rules are made, but we do get quite some calls from, from customers saying we need to go bilateral because it's become too expensive for us. And that's an interesting debate to have where what the sort of, what the anchor point for that is. Um, at the same time, we believe from a, uh, from a clearinghouse perspective that there's a, there's a new normal in the market at some point and that the liquidity as a result of that will back, come back to the cleared markets. And as a result of that also, we need to look at this from a risk management and resilience perspective, which is the foremost role of the CCP. And so as a result of that, yeah, we're, we're essentially managing the situation and we're also managing the, the implementation of the proposals that are coming from the EU at the moment. This is the, the key priority for us at this point. If we look a little bit more in the detail, um, you can actually see, and I think Carolina, we saw that in your graph before as well, but there was a peak day, uh, which was the 26th of August. Um, and that was the same case across Europe. So we know that there were two, three other CCPs that had the same peak day, and it was driven by essentially two, three clearing members that we're having a peak day in several CCPs, as I think most, most of you know. Um, very swiftly after that, the Swedish government issued the guarantee scheme, which we very much welcomed because we had been in a dialogue, obviously, with many of you in this room. But we were anticipating that it might either take longer or that it would need to be managed in a different way. Right. So we were in the weeks before that. We were in a close dialogue with a lot of the energy producers, essentially helping them bring their exposures down. And I think we've been speaking to, to many of you in this room about that as well. And it's interesting when, when you do that, because effectively 
what they need to do is they need to manage the exposure limit uh, utilization they have with us uh, because we do have a limit of how much they can put through the clearinghouse compared to other uh, compared to the OTC market essentially. So they need if they go above that limit, they need to channel the the rest of the liquidity to OTC. This this is how the mechanism works. Um, and happy to go through that a little bit more in in the detail when we have the discussion. But so when the when the program was launched, we um, implemented that relatively swiftly in in our systems. I think like two weeks after that, and you can see we've essentially um, tailored also the way we communicate about the energy markets to um, to to account for the government guarantee scheme. Um, and at this point in time, also going back to the EU dialogue, uh, we're looking at the next stage from here. So we need to look at how are we going to implement the, the non-collateralized bank guarantees and how do they interact with the government guarantees. That, that for us at the moment is, is the key priority. Uh, for some of the other proposals, they're more focused on the, the stock exchange. And here we, we tend to take a, a cautious approach uh, from a Nasdaq perspective. So we don't really like closing down markets unless if we have to, like last week. I think some of you may have seen. Um, but generally, we're, we believe that the market should be open and the prices should be formed in, in the normal way, so to say, which may be opposing to some of the other speakers. So that's, I think, the, the key overview from our angle. Uh, on the next page, we're essentially just showing a little bit more uh, in the detail how the margin requirements have been uh, increasing over time. And then also um, how they then, through the bank guarantees, how that could, could essentially change. Uh, I'm not going to go into that in much more detail because I think we've covered it a little bit with the speakers before. Um, right. But then I think the interesting question is, what is the market design going to look like going forward? How is the structure going to evolve? Uh, we, we're continuing our efforts to look at the market design overarchingly because we like to look at it from the perspective of the exchange, the perspective of the cleared market, but also uh, from the perspective of helping our customers across their whole portfolio, including what they put OTC. So we have a dialogue with them about that as well. Um, and then ultimately, I think we, we need to come back also to the question of what does this mean for the households? Um, how can we ensure to have efficient hedging tools so that the households don't have exploding energy prices over the next months? And I think the industry overall has been speaking about the winter is coming since quite a while now. At the moment, the markets are relatively calm, at least since the introduction of the guarantee scheme. And I think, therefore, the priority should be, from my perspective, to introduce as little measures as possible, because you don't want to confuse the market with too many different things. Um, and then also, essentially, to see how the micro-political situation is going to evolve, and against that backdrop, how we can all work together to to manage the next three to 12 months, I would say. I'm going to leave it here and hand it over to Matt. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Matt Basham, Vice President Trading and Optimization at Fortum. You have the last word before the discussion, please. <laughs> Thank you very much. and. Uh... Thank you for getting the chance to, to be here. So I'm Mats Persson, I'm head of the um, hedging and trading operations at, at Fortum. Fortum is a Finnish company, I'm a Swede. So it means that I spend a lot of time in teams or in Finland, not so much time in Stockholm. Uh, the, I, I will not show you any PowerPoint presentation here, but I would like to show you <clears throat> a bit of the, let's say, <clears throat> practical experiences of uh, uh, from a power producer's point of view. Um, 
But uh, before I go into the very recent development, I would like to take us back in time a bit uh, <clears throat> and um, let's say put the current situation into a, uh, let's say, 30 years historical perspective. Uh, so the Nordic market was uh, deregulated in, uh, or let's say the Swedish part of the Nordic market was deregulated in uh, back in 1996. And uh, in practice, it basically meant that the uh, old vertical integration in the power industry got broken. Typically, uh, before the deregulation, the power producers sold directly to their customers, which were located in their local uh, grids. And there was no need for a, a power exchange uh, because you very much knew, knew uh, how much to produce for your customers in your local areas. Uh, but when, when the market got deregulated, then, I mean, the point was then that uh, the customers then could choose the supplier of electricity and uh, thereby uh, you, you could no longer sort of plan your production in respect of your customer's consumption, but you basically started to plan in respect of what, what is the market price going to be in the, the future. Uh, Fortum's take on this was that, okay, then we, we better arrange the, our trading and asset optimization activities accordingly. So we are already from the beginning have been very, let's say, uh, market liberal so that we like to use the centralized clearing as much as possible and the exchanges as much as possible, which in practice means that we are selling our production to the exchange and the electricity we need for the customers, we buy from the exchange. So we typically don't do in net it internally. Uh, and I would say that <coughs> Nordic region, the Nordic market was a forerunner here. We developed uh, this faster and better than most other places in, in the world, I would say, and many other parts of Europe were and, and the world were looking at the Nordic region as a good example of how a well market, market well working liberalized market could could look like. Uh, <clears throat> so I would say things were quite fine until 2008. Then we got the financial crisis, and that was explained earlier here. The consequences of that with the increased market regulation. Uh, but then some uh, not so good things started to happen at the financial part of the market, the volume started to go down. Even though the intention was, I would say, the, obviously the opposite, to get more volumes to decentralized clearing, it actually started to lead to the opposite. Um, so from the peak in 2008, when, uh, if you now speak about Nasdaq as an example, some um, roughly 2,500 terawatt hours were traded at Nasdaq clearing, uh, at Nasdaq and cleared at, at uh, Nasdaq clearing. That volume went down gradually, and if we now jump forward to 2018, we got a, I would say, a local crisis in the Nordic region, which was triggered by a speculative trader in Norway called Einar Ås, who couldn't actually meet the margin calls, and uh, he went uh, default. Uh, I would say that back then, we, uh, this was sort of defined as a catastrophe and crisis and, and uh, for this instance Fortum we were the biggest member at clearing we were the company who lost most money because of this because we lost the money in the default fund uh, but now in in uh, hindsight I would say that thanks to this ANRO's case uh, things started to uh, get improved uh, especially I would say the risk management framework at Nasdaq clearing so now when the real crisis uh, happened in uh, 2022, uh, we were, uh, the market was better prepared. This sounds a bit weird, but I, I, I would like to highlight that we, we could actually have been worse without this sort of wake up call back in 2018. Uh, then uh, uh, in the Fortum's case, like I said, we, we basically all our trading went through the exchanges. Um, uh, but back actually after the ANRO's case, we started to get some challenges because the volumes were decreasing at the market. So the market liquidity and the debt of this market started to go down. We uh, started to move volumes away from the clearing to the bilateral trading. And as we have like mentioned by Vincent here, typically producers have hedge exemption 
we can actually move quite a lot of the volumes out from the clearing without getting limited by this threshold of 3 billion. Uh, but at that point, it was mainly because we couldn't simply sell as much as we wanted to sell. Um, but then uh, if we jump forward now to uh, end of 2021, uh, then we started to suspect that this may also become a cash liquidity issue. And, and uh, simply, we, we did some stress tests. Uh, what if uh, 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 Russia would attack Ukraine? And what if we wouldn't get gas to Europe? Of course, we couldn't predict that. And, and it was sort of uh, probability-wise something that we, we <laughs> really not likely, thought it wouldn't be likely. But still, we made some stress tests and realized that we, we actually, we wouldn't cope cash-wise if we wouldn't start to kind of speed up and move away from the clearing. So we actually we speed it up from the turn of the year. Uh, right now, we have actually only quite small part of our hedging at the clearing, uh, which means that we have built up a quite, let's say, different credit risk profile against our uh, bilateral counterparties. Uh, but uh, the, the difference here between the bilateral trading and, and the clear trading is that then we typically use uh, forward contract instead of futures. It's, it's a bit technical thing. Uh, now I need to find an end here. But then uh, just a short uh, comment on that means that uh, by using this forward, we don't need to pay this cash upfront but we settle it in delivery. So that has been our way uh, to survive. Then short comment on, on the, the things that have been presented here as, let's say, uh, improvements of the uh, uh, clearing activities in the regulation. Basically, we see positive on all these things and we, because we strongly believe that, after all, a better alternative is to trade at an exchange and do it to a clearing. That what is what we would prefer, even though we have, like I said, moved a lot away from a lot of our volumes, volumes away from it. Uh, my only kind of disclaimer is actually the same as pointed out by Vincent here that this threshold change from three to four billion that that wouldn't actually make too big difference because from the producer's point of view, I mean, the producers are anyway exempted from this, so it doesn't actually make any difference. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, sorry to stress you, but we are running out of time. If we can have everybody up on stage. Um, I did promise the audience an opportunity to ask questions. Uh, we have learned, at least I have learned a lot from all these great presentations. And I thought we might, since we have 15 minutes left, if we can take three questions, uh, and let the panel choose from between these three questions that may be a good model to Magnus, please, in, in your name, you will get the microphone and present yourself. Uh, my name is Magnus Ugla. Uh, I'm on the resolution board here in Sweden. And uh, my question is, uh, it would be interesting to hear somebody assess the financial stability risks of larger volumes moving out of the clearing into the uh, OTC market, uh, what would the implications be for the financial stability? Okay. What are the implications for stability of moving out from the exchange on into more bilateral? Do I see any more hands? I do. Yes, please. Um, Matthias from the Financial Supervisor Authority. Uh, under current regulation, would you say that the energy derivatives market is clearable? Yes. Um, thank you, Urban Thunred from the Swedish Securities Markets Association. If I could ask uh, Carolina and Paulina perhaps to uh, say something about the kind of connection between the measures taken in, in the Nordic countries and the measures and activities going on at EU level. That would be interesting. <clears throat> okay. Has the panel understood the questions? <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to start? Paulina, you were directly addressed in, in one of the questions. And Paulina, for that matter. Yeah, so uh, yes, Urban. Um, I mean, there is a, 
as Paulina, I think, explained, of course, also at an EU level, uh, there is work ongoing trying to facilitate for the member countries to do things like we did uh, in at the end of August and early September. And she mentioned uh, state aid rules. So, of course, when you con consider um, support, giving financial support in uh, various forms, you do have to consider the state aid rules that we have to ensure uh, the single market. Um, so um, that is something where we always have to check with Brussels whether uh, what we do uh, is consistent uh, with the rules. But And that uh, is an aspect that um, partly determined the design of what we did. I mean, the, the fact that we guarantee only 80% and not 90 or 100, uh, that's also something uh, that uh, has been um, used before and that is compatible with, uh, with the EU uh, common rules. So there is a connection there, but then when it comes to the to the e to the Commission's uh, proposals uh, on how to uh, increase the scope of collateral and put in uh, price caps and so forth, that I mean that's something where the Swedish government is part of negotiations. Uh, I presume, but Paulina can perhaps say something about that. Helene, could I ask you before Paulina takes over, is it your impression that the guarantee has helped in sort of calming the markets and, and making this situation more manageable? I think so. I mean, it, it's a little bit unclear because, so uh, I, maybe I should go back to where we were when we made this decision. So it was end of a week. Uh, there were these extreme price movements. But on the Friday, there was always new, also news coming out that Russia wasn't going to supply gas through Nord Stream 1. Mm. So we had been discussing this, the relevant authorities, for some time. And then our assessment was that Monday or next week, early next week, there might be even worse price movements. And given the problems that we've just had, that could really trigger something. And that's why there was these dramatic events with press conferences during the weekend and so forth. But the coming week, that didn't really happen. Was that because of the measures? Uh, I mean, since then, prices have really calmed down a bit. Mm. Uh, I think that the measures are important because that's what uh, the different um, relevant parties are saying. And I think it's uh, something that makes uh, is something that makes uh, the clearing members um, and other um, stakeholders more comfortable and secure. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But to link it exactly to what happened, it's, it's a bit difficult, but I think... Okay. Mats... Uh, Pauline, a short comment as well before I give Mats a chance. Yeah, no, just very, very briefly, because I think Carolina said it very well already to, to Urban. I think there are basically, as, as so often when it comes to EU policy, there are different levels here. One is the what we try to do at the EU-wide system level, if you wish, and I, I explained some of those measures. And then, of course, there is the possibility for member states to give public support in light of their national circumstances, but subject to the EU uh, state aid framework. So I don't think... As far as I can see, there's no kind of incompatibility. This is basically the way the system works. Some member states, like Sweden, but also others, have chosen to, to intervene with, with public guarantees in line with the EU state aid framework. So I, I think that, for me, these things are probably complementary, if you, if you wish. And then, if I may, just very briefly, because I think it's come up a lot, of course, the financial stability uh, dimension and um, what happens if a lot of trades move uh, OTC. I think several of you also commented on the increase of the clearing threshold. I think the issue here is really to find a balance. And I think that was something that ESMA was looking at very, very carefully when looking into this clearing threshold uh, matter to precisely see, of course, we don't want in any way to endanger financial stability. I, I tried to make that very clear in my intervention, but I'm happy to say it again. I think that's really for us being the leading light here 
we don't want to disrupt the price formation process. We certainly do not want to in any way endanger financial stability. And it's basically kind of that balance, um, but still being meaningful for the energy traders. And that's basically the kind of balance we have tried to, to find. But again, I mean, financial stability is, of course, uh, paramount here in, in, this, in this debate. Thank you. I'll stop there. OK, Matt, short comment. Very short comment on this uh, kind of uh, hen and the egg question about the effect of the uh, this, uh, uh, liquidity source support scheme which was launched in in Sweden. I I I uh, tend to think that it it's actually was a reason why the market didn't actually continue upwards in the beginning of the following week uh, because it's uh, what I mean the alternative for the. Uh, uh, clearing members, if they run out of, of, of cash, is basically to start to close the position. And, and we are speaking about thousands of megawatts per each member. Uh, and they, they, that would could actually have led to even escalating prices with the, without having the comfort of having credit support. Okay, Daniela. Yeah, maybe just to add briefly from a so clearinghouse perspective and also from the exchange perspective, we, we feel also that it, it was a combination, right? A, a, an interesting coincidence, if you will, that the measures were timed at a point in time when some other developments happened as well. As well. So I do think we would might have seen a bit more of a spike, but it, it, it's hard to calibrate that in some mathematical form or so. So it was really a good combination of measures at the same time, I would say. Okay. Uh, what about Magnus Oglas question? If if this all leads to trading moving out of the exchanges and into more bilateral, is that really enhancing stability or sort of is there a risk in that? Does anybody well, want to I mean, take from, that? From uh, I'm looking at you. Yes, <laughs> you are. So that's why I answering uh <laughs> But I think from, I mean, from the authorities that are um, responsible for um, for financial stability in Sweden, uh, it's of course a negative development because if if it's cleared uh, in the at the central clearinghouse, then we can follow the positions. Uh, we know uh, what's being done, and it's also uh, an institution that is set up to handle. Uh, risks of various sorts and with the bilateral trade we we don't really have that insights and it's not regulated in the same way i don't know if i have to ask Daniela or but yeah, i would just add one thing because the question has come up quite a bit in the aftermath of um what what happened uh, and that is that we have separate default funds for financial markets commodities markets and seafood so we have three default funds and we feel that that at, at least creates a layer of protection that you would not have if everything was in the same default fund. And we created that 2021 in the aftermath of the 2018 default. So, And the third question, I'm not sure I, it was very short, I'm not sure I got it. Uh, we have a perfect storm in the sense of liquidity, but also the kind of regulation. If it wasn't clear, we wouldn't be in this position we're in right now because of the initial margin requirements. So as we're seeing that liquidity is moving away from CCP, which is unfortunate, of course, this is a problem that we are in a situation where the relegation is so stringent that it is not clearable in this situation. Okay. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we again, we've had that question a few times, and obviously I, I may be a bit biased in that because of what the business we run. Um, but... If to, in taking a step back, what I would say is that usually we, we keep a close eye on the open interest and the liquidity in the contracts. And if there are contracts that are not trading, we close them down because we don't like to create additional risks by having contracts open that there's no activity in. Be, beyond that, I would say the clearability question is always linked to whether the price formation and the processes behind that are, are trustworthy. And I, I would argue that that's the case, but that there's quite a lot of different measures coming together at this point. So it needs to be very actively managed to 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 uh, create the best result for everybody. No, no. Yes, no, I think it's the, it's the key question because um, if we ask everybody in this room, like in an ideal world, everybody would prefer to to clear in the CCP. And I think that that's what Matt's uh, said so so on also to reflect on your question, I think this the bilateral component of the market, the OTC component is not <clears throat> anymore the wide west that it may have been before the financial crisis so there are also rules there for non-cleared uh, der derivatives 
Uh, and, but you know, to your question, I, I agree. Like you know, if financial you know market participants find it uneconomical to actually clear these contracts, uh, I think we need to think about you know the appropriate level of initial margins on the CCPs, and that's what I I made my point, which which maybe Daniela doesn't like, which which is the following. Um, you know, CCPs often think as initial margin as, you know, like they should protect any kind of default, right? We should be totally insulated from the default of a member. Uh, I want to take a slightly different view. Uh, my point is that, you know, these default funds are here precisely to have some kind of orderly uh, sharing of these losses. So, of course, you know, when Fortum has to pay for somebody else, they don't like this. Uh, but if you have like good membership requirements, you would expect that all the members are kind of the same. So sometimes it's you lose, sometimes I lose. And uh, that's a good restraining arrangement. So I don't know if there can be some kind of reflection on, on the level of initial margin so that people come back to, to CCPs. I think there shouldn't be too much of a disconnect between high margin in CCPs and, and maybe too low margins in the OTC segment. OK, we have unfortunately run out of time. Uh, that's a pity. But you have been a great panel. I've learned a lot, and it's been really, really great. From Paulina I, on the screen, Carolina. Mats, Daniela, Vincent, very good work. Thank you so much.